Oh, Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Lambert. You see who I have on the screen, don't you? If you don't know who he is, you might want to check him out on YouTube. He's debated some big names. William Lane Craig used to be a hero figure of mine within Christianity. And uh, not saying anything bad. I'm just saying I'm no longer a Christian. So he's not one of the guys I look to to find out information, so to speak. And Graham Oppie, uh, Dr. Oppie, has actually debated him and has had uh, many series of conversations throughout YouTube. And I said to myself, how can I be myth vision if I don't have Dr. Oppie come on and actually explain what atheism is, naturalism, materialism? Like, we need to get into these conversations. I'm not a philosopher. So, Dr. Oppie, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about your credentials, and then I'd like to press us into the conversation. Okay, so very quickly, I'm currently... Um, professor of philosophy at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. So I've been at Monash for the past 25 years and I've been a professor for about the last 15 years. My field of expertise is philosophy of religion. So primarily what I teach at Monash these days is either philosophy of religion or metaphysics. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Ladies and gentlemen, be sure to go check out his Twitter. You can follow him and uh, you can't message him. So don't try and harass the guy, <laughs> but he, but he's on Twitter as well as his books. You know, he's gave me a fair warning, but I told him I'm afraid some of my audience members are, are brighter than the typical. There's going back for my guys who've watched myth vision. Um, some of these books are seriously heavy. This is a highly recommended one for the general audience of the public, if you will. Like, like almost anyone who's got a basic understanding of things can grasp this book, Atheism, The Basics. But if you really want to do a deep dive on this, he has plenty of other material. I absolutely recommend it. But listen, actions speak louder than words. My words don't mean anything here. Let's listen to the conversation today. You tell me if you're interested in checking out his book. So, Dr. Oppie, let's start off real simple. There has to be a God, right? Like, duh, like, how are we here? <laughs> so, so it's interesting that you say that. Like, I, there are plenty of people in my family, like in my extended family, like my various uncles who say exactly that to me when we get together for family gatherings. And I just say, no, there doesn't have to be a God. Uh, in fact, I think we can explain everything that needs explaining without supposing that there's a God. And so since we can do without God, we should. Mm. So a lot of people, when they, and I'm jumping, by the way, we might bounce around, but th this is what, you know, this is just major points I hear all the time. But Dr. Oppie, don't, don't you look around in the universe and it's like this giant clock. It almost reminds us of a giant brain. Uh, it's a mind of its own. And, and it looks like there's a, uh, you know, look at the, the temperature outside and we're at the right distance and everything's just right for life. Don't you think we were created with a purpose and that God made this and there's a mind behind all this? Um, okay, so to, to respond to that kind of argument, that kind of design argument, it's a fairly long story. <laughs> um, so it's, it's unclear where I should start. And what, what you would like, what you'd like me to try to explain. So one kind of thing that you might be thinking about is that kind of animals are a bit like clocks, right? And uh, there's there's so much complexity in animals that just looking at the animals, there's got to be some explanation for the complexity. And the best explanation that we can come up with is that they were made that way by God. Now that's that's a kind of story that might have really gripped people more than 200 years ago. But after Darwin, there's a kind of different story that's really broadly accepted in the scientific community, that if you wind the clock back far enough, there are none of these complex creatures. And then there's a very long process of biological evolution that um, takes us from a state where there are none of these creatures to the state where there are lots of them. So that kind of complexity isn't evidence for God. Right. So that's that's one kind of aspect of this. Different kind of aspect, and more recently, people have thought uh, that there's a kind of argument from physics. If you look at the, the universe, 
uh, and you look at certain very general parameters that characterize the universe, if those parameters have been a little bit different, then the universe just wouldn't have existed in the form that we know it either. It would have kind of collapsed in on itself almost as soon as it began, or it would have blown apart so rapidly that it would be basically just empty space. And so you might think that somebody, <laughs> some sort of mind, chose the parameters to take just the values that they do. Right, now, uh, response to that, well, there's a question, I mean, there are various questions. One question is whether really there's no explanation from within physics for the values of the parameters. Put that to one side, because um, that's kind of, that's really just a question for future physics. Suppose it's true that there are these values and they, and they happen to be just right for, not just for life, but for all kinds of things. There wouldn't be stars, right? Or if, for example, unless the values were just right. Question, so when were the values set, right? There's two possibilities. They've always been set, or there was a point where there was this transition from when the values weren't set to when they were. Now, I think if there's a transmission point, then that really just means that it's chance, right? That, assuming that there's all these values that they could have taken, and there's just this transition. They weren't fixed, and all of a sudden they are. Presumably that's just because there's this chance falling into particular values. Now, that's a story that both theists and naturalists can accept, but it gives no advantage to either side. So the other possibility is that they've always been fixed from the whatever the beginning point is. They've always been fixed at that value. But then there's two possibilities, either or two things you might say. Either they've always been fixed because they had to take those values, or else, again, it's just chance because it's right at the very beginning. There's nothing that you can peel to that's earlier that would explain them. So according to me, there's no advantage here for theists. Naturalists and um, theists can tell the same story about why the constants fall into the range that they do. It's either because they had to or because they've fallen into it by chance. And that's the story either way. Interesting. Okay. Um, you have said before that you were a materialist. And I've actually interviewed a previous philosopher, PhD, who said ma materialism is not possible. Um, it, you know, he's coming from an idealist philosophical mm -hmm. background, which means inevitably you're going to have a disagreement there. So he does not see it as plausible. Would you mind maybe, and I know this is a huge question you've written books on that are seriously complex on this, but is materialism a plausible explanation for the universe? And does it make more sense to you than any other position? So I guess I, pref I mean, there, there's a bunch of labels here, materialism, right. physicalism, naturalism, and there are fine distinctions that you could draw between them. I would prefer to call myself a naturalist rather than a materialist, but it doesn't, it's not really going to make any difference for the purposes of this conversation. So let's just run with materialism. I take it that um, the kind of best overall story to tell is one on which there's um, a causal network and all the kind of nodes in the network are, I mean, depending how we think about the causal relation, either material objects or material events, right? And that's what the kind of materialist position should amount to, that in the causal domain, basically everything that kind of figures in it is material. Uh, I mean, I would prefer to say that there's a kind of natural domain and everything in it's natural, but right. it doesn't, right, it doesn't matter. Now, I think that that's the best option. You could go for a different kind of view, maybe, although I think it's quite hard to really make sense of it. Um, a kind of view on which there are non-material minds that are distributed in some kind of space, somehow connected to one another, somehow given perceptions and 
there's a story either that each of the minds makes up for itself or that they all make up collectively about a network of material causes. But that story is way more complicated than the one that just supposes that we're parts of material reality and that we interact with it. Because you've ended up with sort of for every bit of detail in the kind of materialist story, there's some corresponding detail in the idealist story, the bit about how the, the you know, the, the world's constructed in the minds of in, in the minds, but you've also got the minds and you've also got to have a source for all of the inputs to the minds, right? Otherwise, you've got the worst possible theory, really. You've got no explanation where anything comes from. That is where any of the perceptions come from. On the materialist story, it's kind of straightforward. If you see a tree, there are photons hitting your eye. There's processing in your brain. That processing in your brain just is you're seeing the tree, right? On the idealist story, you have this perception of a tree, what's its cause, right? Um, everything should have a cause, so you've got to put one in. But once you put the causes in and the causes of the, I mean, that, that's the what, what puts it into your mind, we, now we're just going to compare that with the, there's a tree, there's photons, there's processing in your brain, and that's your perceiving. And it, I, it seems to me clear that it's going to turn out that the materialist story is way more simple and plausible than the alternative. <laughs> uh, I really appreciate you answering these questions for me. And I know that like some of these are deep uh, diving already uh, that I'm throwing at you. Um, you know, something that comes to mind, I've been looking at these I'm trying to find a natural explanation for everything. And I openly say this, and maybe I'd like your correcting me in particular. I'm asking you as a philosopher to maybe help me out. I admit, and I've said this on air, and maybe I should rephrase this, but I'm asking for your correction. I am purposely biased on looking for a natural explanation because I always tried to look for supernatural ones or assumed uh, causals, if you will, uh, agency and things that potentially didn't have agency or whatever it might be. I was always exploring and saying God did it or it was this or it's that, a miracle, this, this, that. Yeah. Now I'm like on the other spectrum and I'm purposely looking for like physical, material, natural, if you will, causal relations for things, explanations to make better sense. People don't rise from the dead. Why do you say they don't, Derek? Isn't it possible they could? I guess I'm not – I don't want to commit a fallacy and say it's not possible, but I've never seen anything like that. So – why do people believe that Jesus rose from the dead, for example? And since you're a philosophy in, in religion, maybe you can help me. Am I on the right track of trying to say maybe there's a natural explanation for why people believed that this guy rose from the dead or X, Y, and Z might have happened or you name it? So I think it might be useful to distinguish between two different kinds of questions here. So one question is um, supposing that you're a – materialist or a naturalist, how you should think about things, right. right? Just when you're thinking about things for yourself, working out what you're going to think. So, I mean, take this this thing that there are people who believe that Jesus rose from the dead, right? So what kind of explanation do you really need to seek for that? Um, not much because I mean, the kind of outlines of the story of why they believe it are going to be straightforward. They believe it because other people who they trusted told them that it was so, and that's why they believe it, right? And there's no mystery in that. From a kind of naturalistic point of view, that bit of the story is easy. Right. Now, you might think, if we trace it right back, what happened back in right, right. 33 AD? <laughs> um, and, happened, yeah. and, and the answer to that is that we've got such patchy evidence that it's very hard to tell, right? What, what would have been really nice would have been if people had kept diaries in Jerusalem in 33 AD and, you know, sort of like everybody kept diaries and they wrote down everything that happened and we could go and inspect them and we could get kind of, well, however, I don't know what the population was, say it was 10,000 people, we could get 10,000 opinions about what happened during that year and then we could... And then we could try to use that to work out where the truth lay. And of course, I mean, even then, in that case, there'd be lots of disagreement in the diaries about what happened and, and, and so on. But um, 
you'd have more chance of working out from that what were the kind of publicly observable events that actually happened in the city at the time. But we don't have that. We've got a tiny number of texts. Um, it's unclear. I mean, there's some dispute about when they were written, but it seems pretty clear that they were written quite a long time after the event. I mean, there's an exception. Some of Paul's letters are fairly early, but they're pretty skimpy on details, right, the kinds of details that you get out of the, out of the Gospels. So um, the kind of short answer is we don't really know, but um, there's, some, there's an important other thing to say here, which is some stuff about how easy it is for lots of people to reach consensus on, on beliefs that are just false, right? And there's plenty of recent examples. In some ways, you might think that it's easier now than it was back then because of the internet. But um, I think, you know, the same principles are gonna apply. So there are some people who have beliefs that are false and they spread them. They're convincing, they tell other people, they might sincerely believe what they're saying, but they've just got the wrong end of the pineapple. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and some story like that is going to be the right story, but there's no about, about the bits of the gospels that are supernatural, right? They ultimately, at some point, somebody came to a false belief and told other people and the other people believed it and it became part of their tradition and in the end when it was written down it was written down right <laughs> and and now that's this is not the view of a kind of biblical expert you can you know if you get someone like Bart Ehrman or you know whoever on they'll be deeply invested in the kind of scholarly disputes about all kinds of things questions about which parts of those texts are kind of original and which bits were kind of later editions or forgeries or whatever and so on. But um, the actual putting it together and making a kind of definitive account of what happened in around 33 AD seems to me to be a fairly hopeless project. If you talk, like I, I have, I'm in a school of philosophy and history amongst other things. And when I talk to my sort of ancient historical friends, I mean the ones who study ancient history, <laughs> right? The, and, and none of, most of them don't do the first century for reasons that might seem kind of obvious, but um, what they insist on is how speculative and tentative anything that you might say about ancient history is, right? I mean, you, where you've got kind of material evidence, archeological evidence, you can kind of speak more confidently. Where you've got texts, there's huge difficulties in interpreting the texts and, right. um, and so on. So that's the kind of stuff that I would talk about. So briefly, I think, and we've jumped around, but <laughs> we went from the beginning of the universe to Jesus. Um, uh, that was quick because, you know, most uh, theists who debate that are Christians, they start with uh, theism just generally. And then they want to go to, well, he died and rose again. And you're like, what? Where did you make this connection? Uh, it's, <laughs> it's fascinating. Atheism. What is the definition for atheism? I don't want to get lost in this, but there is it. I mean, it's clearly the lack of belief uh, in gods or a god, from what I understand. And sometimes a positive uh, uh, assertion that there's no god, right? So it's a matter for stipulation, I think, how you want to define most terms, um, most sort of controversial philosophical terms. And so what, what's important isn't the terminology, it's the kind of distinguishing between views. So some people are going to believe that there are no gods and some people are going to suspend judgment on the question whether um, there are gods. And if you put those two groups together, what you end up with is people who don't believe that there are right. gods, right? So there are kind of two species there. Now, exactly who gets to claim the label atheism is a matter of difference to me. Uh, my own view is, is that there are no gods. And so when I'm using the word atheism, I'm going to use it for my position. Right? But it's completely it really doesn't matter what we call things so long as we're all clear how we're using the words and we kind of keep everything straight let me let me probe you if you don't mind i love this and and i hope you don't mind my excitement i'm just this is stuff i love to to 
you know, talk about when you say there are no gods, you sound very confident, right? You, you didn't waver. You didn't stutter. You didn't hesitate. You sounded pretty certain that there are no gods. Can you so, tell me what you mean? Um, so if, if you ask me, so philosophers will sometimes say that there are kind of two different ways of talking about beliefs. So we can talk about them in this kind of all or nothing way. Right, either you believe something or you don't. Maybe we might add some gradations in there, say that, well, you know, you can kind of strongly believe it or less strongly believe it while still believing it, or it's kind of more or less strongly disbelieve it, or be kind of right, kind of neutral in the middle, neither believing nor disbelieving. Right. They also sometimes talk about credences and think that you would kind of attach probabilities to um, claims. And so if you've got credence one, in something that means you're certain. If you've got credence zero, then you're certain that it's false. If you're at point five, that puts you right in the middle, you're undecided. Now, um, if you're asking me what's my credence, yeah. um, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna say uh, practically it's one. That is in my everyday life, I never think, oh, what if? What if there's a God or, you know, um, should I worry about doing this because God might be watching or should I pray or whatever? Not, none of that, right? It plays, that, those kind of beliefs just play no part in my regular life. In, in discussion, in a, in a kind of theoretical discussion, I'm not going to say one. I'm going to say, say close to one that you can't tell the difference, right? So, so that I will back off from saying completely certain because I think that um, absolute certainty should be reserved for, you know, things like certain kinds of mathematical claims. And I don't think the claim that there are no gods is quite like, you know, the claim that two and two are four. And I guess defining what a god or gods is is important too. And you've you said in a recent interview, I saw you on, um, you know, something that has power over all other things or, you know, something to the general gist of having power over either the world or all things, other things than itself even, uh, something like that. Can you maybe specify? Okay, so this is going to test my memory a bit. Uh, so, um, and it probably it's probably not quite right also, but roughly you could think of the gods as being the most powerful beings uh, in various kinds of worldviews. That doesn't mean that in every worldview that gods will be the most powerful beings. So for naturalists, uh, supposing that humans are the most powerful beings, that doesn't make us gods, according to naturalists. So an important part of the story is going to be that the gods are supernatural. They, they're supernatural beings, but there might be different kinds of supernatural beings. So in Christianity, angels are supernatural, but they're not gods, you know, and likewise for demons. Um, what's the difference? Well, in Christianity, there's one God that sits above everything else and is kind of in control of everything, is ultimately responsible for the existence of everything. In other religions where you, where you might have a different God or, or you might have more than one God, the gods are at the top level in terms of their control over what happens, mostly. That's not exactly right, because, for example, in the Greek, story the fates have a certain amount of control over the gods ah, that's right. um, so um yeah that that story can't be exactly right but it's a very important element in thinking about the gods that the gods have certain kind of immense power over people over human beings um, that seems to be a kind of core idea in the the notion of gods. Interesting. Um, you know, I've, I had Andy Thompson. He's a uh, MD and uh, I can't remember exactly his specialty, but he worked with uh, the Dawkins Foundation and um, he came and did a presentation. He's wrote a book called Why We Believe in Gods. And he goes into like all the natural processes in the brain and then why we project, uh, you know, uh, we project, uh, I don't know why I'm getting a blank here, that there's actual 
there's something there that there's not uh, agency and things that aren't yeah. there. Uh, how evolution played a role into why we believe things at all and how it helped us to survive and things like that. Does any of evolutionary uh, byproducts, if you will, play a role into your understanding of philosophy as an atheist? So that the story about um, that, that cognitive science story, or really it's a kind of set of stories that seek to explain um, the origins of religious belief in our kind of hair trigger agency detection or something like that, uh, probably has some plausibility as part of the story. So uh, one, one book that I really liked um, in, that gives you a kind of complicated account of religion in which that's one of a range of factors is Scott Atron's book in Gods We Trust, which is quite old now, it's 2002. And I think that the story about religion and why people have the kind of religious beliefs that they do and engage in the kinds of practices that they do will have to be at least as complicated as the story that Atron tells and perhaps it will have to be even <laughs> more complicated than that. So I've, I don't think that the story about kind of hair trigger agency detection is the whole story, but I think that it could be a little part of the story. And th there's a, there will be a kind of evolutionary account, but it's not just um, a, a sort of straightforward account about certain features of our cognition, because there's a kind of social evolution of religion and there's a kind of, I expect if you go back kind of far enough, there's a fairly complex um, interaction between our biological evolution and our social evolution. And you, you, you may have to go back like 100,000 years or more um, to, to be able to see this. Right. right. And so, so it won't be just, it, it won't be just a story in which you sort of think about organisms and you think about this, um, these features that develop in their brains. There's a reason why the, um, you know, there, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a much wider story to tell about how we ended up being the kinds of creatures that um, have beliefs in gods. It is interesting. And I recently interviewed Dr. Peter Singer. He's from where you guys are down under. Uh, and he, I asked him in a short you know, interview I did with him, I said, uh, is morality objective? And he said, um, he thinks it is. One of the things he said, though, is he used to be uh, a guy who thought morality was subjective. And he brought up this case example. Someone did. You probably would know when I mention it, um, that they tested humans um, to make decisions saying, look, if you if you could press a button and cause the railroad track to go off and only kill one person instead of five, you know, 80% of the people said, I'd do that. But then if you had to push a guy who was heavy enough off of a ledge to stop from killing five people, would you do it? And 20 or yeah, 20% said, yes, I would. There was morality in this thing. And he thinks that there's an objective morality. What are your thoughts? Do you think that we, or is it subjective and it seems objective based on our cultural, I, I don't know. What, how would you answer that? Okay. So I think that there are some basic moral principles that are more or less universal, and I'm quite happy to think of them as just being kind of necessary truths. So in that sense, we have objectivity. Um, there are truths, basic truths. Now, um, giving examples of, I mean, saying what the basic truths are will be quite difficult, but I can give you examples of truths. So I think, for example, it's just true that it's wrong to torture infants for your own pleasure. I think that's it's just true that that's wrong. Uh, and it couldn't be otherwise. It's not like you can imagine. No, I, I can't. If I start telling you a story about some imaginary world in which it's okay for people to torture infants for pleasure. I think that you'll kind of think, well, there's something wrong with this story. You might as well have written a story in which two and one equals 107, 
right? It would have, you know, I'd have, I'd have had just as much trouble engaging with the story in that case as in the one that you gave. So in that sense, I definitely agree with Peter's current position. I think that there's a kind of objectivity to morality that's kind of actually kind of similar to the objectivity of mathematics. Um, I mean, that might not be Peter's view, but that's my view. Um, on the other hand, uh, the kind of epistemology here is seems easier for mathematics than it is for morality. In mathematics, we can prove things. And once we've proved them, you know, we know where the truth lies. Uh, in ethics, once we've got disputes, they're often quite hard to resolve. And there's nothing like proof that we can appeal to to help us do the resolving. Wow. I think that we agree about lots of stuff. And so, so let's take a basic principle that, that you shouldn't kill. Well, that's not right. I mean, nobody thinks that. The basic principle is, is something more like this. You shouldn't kill except when you're allowed to. Right. And now what happens is that we just disagree about what are the exceptional cases. For some people, there are hardly any. Maybe you can only kill in self-defence or maybe self-defence and defence of kith and kin, right? you yeah, kind of nearest and dearest. Other people might think, no, you can, there's some more things. Like you can kill if you're fighting a just war. You can kill if you're appointed by the state to carry out certain kinds of roles and in the pursuit of those roles like police armed forces or whatever there's kind of no alternative that that's available to you in the circumstances you can kill i mean all the other cases are like this too it has to be kind of there's nothing else you could do uh, but then we can broaden this out some people think it's okay to kill animals um, for food some people think it's okay to do it for fun right um, and so on. And the kind of the question isn't about the principle that you're not allowed to kill except when you're allowed to. The whole questions are about, okay, so which are the cases where you're allowed to? Yeah. So, uh, so I think that it's kind of that you're not allowed to kill except when, when you're permitted to. That strikes me as just the truth, right? Interesting. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. Um, shifting gears just a tad, because I mean, I've been jabbing with various topics. We've been really jumping around and I apologize for that, but that's because I've been interviewing various people on different backgrounds and wanting your specific take. So being someone who is a, you obviously are a professor in philosophy on religion, would you agree that God keeps getting more complex? And what I mean is the way I look at it, when I look at antiquity and I'm checking out these really ancient stories, you get down, let's just say, let's use the Mesopotamian mythologies, for example, or Akkadian, whatever. Then you get down into the Hellenistic age where you have, they're allegorizing uh, ancient stories. Even people who are part of that same tradition start to allegorize. It seems to be a common motif, especially when Hellenization takes over. Um, even a lot of the Old Testament by Philo's allegorized or whatever. Um, follow about Alexandria. I say that to say, like, it seems like the complexity of religion in God or gods become more complicated as our science advances. Is it because they're competing, you think, to try and keep their sacred traditions and religions and say these are still good and we these should be, you know, uh, believed and followed today? And I say that saying I think that that's the case for Christianity. Because when I look at the God of the Bible, he appears to people, he's walking with them like in flesh and bones and in certain sources of the Old Testament, if you take the documentary hypothesis and stuff. But it seems like God could smell the sacrifice of the animals, like he's in space and time. But now you go to people and he's like, he's outside of space and time, beyond our imagination. Hasn't God and these religions evolved to try and keep up with our advancements? So, to, and I guess to some extent that's right. Uh, certainly the conceptions of God ev evolve. Whether Why they evolve um, is perhaps less clear. I'm not sure that it has to do with science. Right. Uh, I mean, it depends a little bit on your views about when and where science was important. Uh, if you have the kind of view which is not uncommon, 
that science really doesn't get going as a kind of institution in the West until Galileo. Um, it had, religion spent a lot of time evolving before then. And it's not clear that science, I mean, let's put that a view aside and suppose, you know, that science is a kind of fairly ancient enterprise and the Greeks um, had in some ways had quite advanced science, for example, in astronomy, mathematics, but there are also kind of aspects of engineering that they were quite advanced in as well. Um, it doesn't seem very plausible that those advancements in science were in any competition with the religions that those people practiced. So I think it's going to be hard to kind of run a story that it's science that pushes religion to to change. What that, that kind of leaves an open question then about about the why there are changes. One thing that I think is useful to look at would be to look at a, a different religion. So look at Hinduism, which is quite old, and look at the extent to which really there have been significant changes in um, Hindu beliefs um, in the last thousand years. And I suspect, although I'm not an expert on this, that you might well find that there's much less dramatic change um, you know, because by, by a thousand years ago, all of the main Hindu schools of philosophy have been established. They've all been arguing with, with each other for a long time. I suspect that you'll find that there's much less change than there is uh, in some other areas. Now, again, um, it's, not, it's not clear that, um, say, that... Catholic beliefs have changed much since the kind of, I mean, Catholic conception of God and the kind of whole theology, the stuff, everything. If you look, if you read Aquinas and you look at the theology now, it's not clear that it's changed that much. Okay. So it is an open question, though, ultimately on what caused the, the um, I mean, some of the things that we see, it might just be a different jurisdiction because Christianity doesn't seem altogether the same as what we see in the Hebrew Bible. It might be mm. utilizing it, but it's a different time too. So a different time, different age, different purposes and cultural dynamics and et cetera, et cetera. There's plenty of factors that might play a huge significant role in that. Um, the question I have for you maybe to be, and I don't know why I keep drawing these blanks every time I go to ask you a question specifically on your particular um, background, but what is your favorite atheist philosopher from antiquity? And I'll say from the Western philosophy, of course, what's your favorite? Okay. So, so let's not go with antiquity because, okay. uh, because it's kind of controversial whether there are um, atheists uh, before the, I mean, some people say before the 18th century. Now, this is tricky. I, I don't believe it. I mean, in the West, and it's clear that in the Indian tradition, um, the Chavakas are atheists, they're materialists there, and the, this is 6th century BC. Uh, but in Greece, it's much more controversial. There's a few people who are known as atheists, but they tended to be people who just rejected the popular gods. And, I mean, it's something that you didn't mention, but you could have, is that at least by the time of Plato, there were monotheists amongst the Greeks because Plato was one of them, people who had this idea about a single um, god. So I would prefer to answer the question in connection with the kind of, um, say, say the 18th century in Europe. Okay. So, so I, mean, I, I guess Holbach is my favourite, but then I kind of like him not so much for his writings but for his absolutely astonishing life. So um, Hol Holbach is one of the most interesting figures in the 18th century, I think. So he um, he had a very rich uncle. His uncle made a fortune on the stock exchange. And um, once, he, once he'd made all this money, he ran a salon in Paris. And when he died, Holbach, was his sole heir. And so he inherited the salon and um, a bucket load of money. And so for the next, for the rest of his life, Holbach ran the best salon in Paris. So they had fantastic food, the best wine. He had, a, he had one of the best libraries in existence. 
uh, and he entertained all of the kind of intellectuals and many of the royals um, of the time. And they so, so and he would have a big collection of people, you know, like there'd be 15, 20 people around the table and they would just talk about whatever. Now, as it happened, he had a kind of inner circle and they were all atheists. And this was at a time when, you know, it wasn't, it was neither respectable nor safe to be an atheist, really. Um, and they were revolutionaries and they had a big influence on the, um, <laughs> what eventually became the French Revolution. And Holbach published a whole stack of anonymous books and nobody knew who was writing these books and it didn't become known that it was him until well into the next century. And so he had this kind of double life because um, he could get, he, he did he did get everybody to come to his salon and they er, everyone kind of willingly participated in these kind of no holes barred conversations about whatever. But on the other hand, he was an extremely radical figure kind of politically and philosophically. Wow. So, so yeah, you know, if if I if I could get in my time machine and go back and meet someone, I'd like to go back to his salon. Maybe on a day when, say, David Hume was there, because Hume visited, because everybody did. So. <laughs> okay. Um, have you heard of Dr. Tim Whitmarsh? He wrote a book called Battling the Gods. Mm -hmm. I've read that book. Okay. Did you? What did you think about his uh, ideas? Because I think he agreed with everything you said about the, the ancients. The difference, though, I think he said it does appear there are some very few it's not like a common thing but there were few in antiquity i guess what's not appealing to you isn't that there weren't possibly atheists it's just what we have of them isn't much it's scant so really nothing influences you on, yeah. on a major scale right so so whitmarsh is one of the influences on my view right when you when you look at the details about the particular people who are known as atheists yeah, there's not much to enable you to say whether they were or they weren't, right. right? And and I figure, I mean, the right approach is for me to, as it, almost everywhere, to key my beliefs to the experts. I take Whitmarsh to be one of the experts, so that's why I have the view that I do, because I've read him and I've read a few other people like him. It's not that I, I'm, for example, I don't read Greek, so I can't do the, or, or Latin, so I can't do the independent research. I totally respect that, and I really enjoyed his book as well, and I can't wait to dig into yours. Um, shifting gears again, <laughs> a presuppositionalist comes at you and says, and I've heard actually uh, there was one named Darth Dawkins. He's kind of a trollish kind of character on the Internet, and uh, I don't know you know, if you know who I'm talking about. But I do because I had a conversation with him once. Can you tell me about this conversation? How would you, you know, if you were to, just tell me what you think about the conversation then we could probe maybe more into so 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 there's i don't know i don't want to say something disrespectful right right so uh but presuppositionalism as a strategy is sort of it feels to me like it's out of a kind of primary school playbook right um because no matter what you might say to a presuppositionalist, they're just going to insist that what you said presupposes that their view is true, right? That's kind of, that's basically the strategy. And you can see that there's not much point getting into a conversation with somebody who has that approach. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to know how to make a conversation with somebody like that more productive. What I try to do is to say, look, there's, we need to probe the notion of presupposition, right? There's, there have been books written by major philosophers about presupposition, and there's a, there's a small range of accounts that you could take about what it is for somebody to presuppose something. And on none of those accounts do I presuppose the things that you're attributing to me. Right. And that's the way that, I mean, it seems like the only kind of way of responding. And it's not going to have any effect because, yeah. because nothing, nothing can. Right. Once you've invested in that rhetorical strategy, you've made yourself, you've cut yourself off both from actually having to sort of think about 
whether your position's defensible. But but from any serious engagement with what anybody else says, that's how it seemed to me anyway. Yeah, there's it's definitely a technique that it, 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 it's almost a script in the head. Well, uh, what is your uh, what is your absolute primary pre? You know, like this foundational, and it's like whoa, like they suppose there must be a first cause that causes everything, of course. And so, how would you address that that idea? And I'm not, you know, I'm not even a Christian, so I'm asking so, you. So, um. I think that it's kind of an open question whether causal reality has an origin or not. So as I guess it's a question for physics. So some physicists, so Anthony Aguirre is one, thinks that there's no origin, right? We live in a multiverse and the, the, the space of the multiverse is infinite in the past. So pick any point, there's an earlier point, there's no origin. Suppose that the multiverse theory is wrong and there's just one universe. It kind of looks as though our universe has an origin. It's clearly expanded from a very small initial state. That much we kind of know. Uh, the details of the very earliest bit still elude us. We don't know how to put quantum mechanics and general relativity together to get a kind of quantum gravitational theory that will accurately describe that first bit. It might be that that's all there is. I mean, there are other possibilities here, sort of bounce possibilities where you get a kind of a kind of endless cycle of expansions and contractions, whatever. But um, maybe that's right. If the universe does have a beginning, you still might think it could be that it kind of gets closer and closer to that origin point without actually reaching it, so there's no beginning. Or you might think, hmm, there's an initial state, right? If there's an initial state, then there is a first cause in that sense, a first cause from which every other, everything follows. That's only one notion of first cause because there's also the kind of Thomistic idea that there's something that supports everything into existence, keeps it in existence from one moment to the next. I don't think you need anything like that. Yeah. Right? I think the universe is kind of, it's a big boy. It can go on on its own. I recently interviewed uh, Professor Krauss, actually, on, uh, you know, he's a theoretical physicist, and he was mentioning, you know, how particles coming in and out of existence, uh, are, you know, that that is a plausible hypothesis for the existence of the universe. And if if it came in with zero energy, then this is why we have a long lasting universe that comes to begin at all. I'm not <laughs> I don't know this stuff like the science and even the philosophy yeah. that you're talking about here. But. Uh, I don't really know any of this stuff like you, and I want to learn more about it, which is why I'm interviewing you now. But it's it's a fascinating discussion because I never thought, is it possible that this, all that we look at, could exist without God? And um, I've really enjoyed this. This has been a fascinating interview. If if someone out there right now is struggling, let's just say they, they – the, all they know is the biblical stuff, but they're interested in doing a dive into trying – reasonably look and say could there not be a god for all causes to be everything that we see is there a, a strong philosophical stance that could be taken that supports the reality that we see around us what would you recommend them do so if hmm, so that's that's kind of an interesting question right, right. uh i mean you're, you're talking to a philosopher so I might, you might expect me to recommend, well, do some philosophy, right? Uh, and maybe that's what I would do. Say, so, okay, so let's let's read some stuff that puts different opinions to the one that you hold and then see whether you think that one of them is better than the opinion that you currently hold, especially if you're kind of wavering on the opinion that you've got at the moment. So, um, for example, you could have a look at um, something written by a naturalist philosopher of religion, defending the kind of naturalistic approach to religion and see what you think. And you might decide after you've read it that actually, you know, it doesn't do it for you and you, you it makes you happier being a theist. Or it might happen that you think, yeah, um, actually, I kind of like that more. And then theism just kind of withers away. 
It could, <laughs> it could, could go either way. You are something else. The way you answered that, that was really well said because you're not forcing anything down anyone's throat. And I appreciate the way you, you dealt with that. Last question I have, and then we'll wrap things up. I hope everybody who's watched this, I hope you, you accept my apologies for jumping around. But if you're watching this, you're probably stuck around this long because you realize, okay, this is a, a lot of interesting points are being covered in this interview. The final one is your, your interview or debate, if you will, with William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig's uh, cosmological you know, argument. Um, I've heard Sean Carroll debate him on this topic and people on either side. William beat him and Sean Carroll's teammate. You know, uh, Sean destroyed William. What would you say the weakest points of his position are based on your arguing or debating Dr. William Lane Craig? Okay, so that's really hard to say. I know Bill quite well, and we've we've corresponded a bit over the years. I've had lunch with him a couple of times. Um, He's a great guy, and I so, don't want this is not a jab yeah, at him. You know what but, I mean? Yeah, no, but um, so I'm not sure that I'm going to say there's a kind of there's a kind of weak weak spot where we can go in and kind of you know we pull this little string here and the whole thing's going to fall apart. Right. I don't think that, um, I mean, his position is one that he's been thinking about for a long time. And whatever questions you ask him, he's going to have answers. There are things that I very strongly disagree with him. What about. are some of those? But but that's a different that's a different matter. Well, I mean, just to, since you asked about the Kalam cosmological argument, um, he thinks that there's, supposing that there's an initial state, there's a reason for thinking that the, that the initial state's got to be, you know, the, there's an origin, it's got to be God, and God makes the universe. Whereas I see no need at all for God, even if there's an initial state. I think we can just suppose that the initial state is whatever, give it whatever status, necessary, contingent, whatever, that Craig wants to give to God and do without God. Right, so that's a big disagreement between us now because that that takes away one of what he takes to be the biggest reasons for wanting to believe in God. Um, at least, or maybe I shouldn't quite put it like that because, after all, he does think that even if the, he would be justified in believing in, in God, even if none of the arguments were any good, right? Because he thinks he's got experience that kind of directly right. supports. Um, his belief but it'll, it turns out that there's like a thousand things that we disagree about right um, there's no there's no one thing that I would point to and say oh, I really can't believe that he believes that thing right yeah. there's a kind of package of things and they fit together the things that he believes I, it seems like um, and I, I can only speak for myself and we can't psychoanalyze other people but it seems like confirmation bias often happens like I wanted a God to be true. I didn't want what I was living to be a lie or potentially, you know, chemical, you know, reactions in the brain with my emotional experience. And here I am. I've got to make this be true. Let me find a worldview with a foundation that supports that premise. It makes me kind of wonder if that's the approach that apologists uh such as Dr. Craig might be doing in order to confirm their already pre-existing beliefs. He will think the same thing about you. Right. That's you why I was really going don't want it to be the case that God exists and you're just looking for things that will justify you in right. that kind of belief. And there's a kind of important kind of underlying point here, which is about the kind of symmetry of the competing positions when people disagree and you, you want to be very careful about the kinds of explaining away that you do of someone else's position mm -hmm. if you haven't first considered whether they're perfectly able to respond by saying the same kinds of things about you so mm -hmm. that's not to say that it might not be true right i mean independently on the basis of psychological research we're all prone to all kinds of biases in our thinking and it may well be that those biases affect what we think about, for example, the existence of God. But that's a kind of that's just a human problem that afflicts 
all of us. It's not something that's kind of a particular problem for naturalists or theists or whoever. So someone right now thinks you don't want to believe in God, uh, just like me. You know what I mean? Someone thinks I don't want to believe yeah. in God. And um, how would you answer them? And then we'll, we'll say goodbye. <laughs> um, uh, okay. So, so I have written some stuff about this too, because it's one, one of the, the kind of interesting questions that's been discussed a little bit in philosophy in the last decade is whether we should want to believe in God, right? And it seems to me that the answer to that question is, um, at least for, for me, I have no desire to believe in God. I don't want to believe in God and I shouldn't, right? So um, I'm kind of happy with that uh, as, a, as a position. Yeah, I'm fine with that too, but I think that often the people who are making that accusation are doing it with motives. It seems like their motives aren't just like, two philosophers might be sitting there they've dealt with these arguments they've literally heard a million of these things before they know the language they don't feel any emotional tension when you say you don't believe in god and you don't want to they don't feel like they have to convert you they don't feel like they're forced to make you change your mind or anything but it sounds like oftentimes that is what i find on my end i was the apologist and now i'm like okay i just want to educate people to know evolution is a fact, you know, not, not just a conspiracy or something like I want people to know some facts and they think that I just don't want to believe in God because I hate God or I want to live a sinful life or whatever it might be. And it's not really my motive it, to me. I honestly am beginning to think like I've been tricked in my own head this whole time. Like I really think I've been tricked and I feel like it's okay that I say that and I'm not asking them to, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the idea that you hate God or that you're sinful or something like that um, is something that, from your point of view, is going to seem really weird. Like, there are all kinds of things I don't believe in, like the Easter Bunny, but I don't hate the Easter Bunny, right? Are you sure? And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm absolutely <laughs> sure, right? Um, I mean, it would be pointless to have an attitude of hatred towards things that don't exist. So, of course, I don't hate God, right? I mean, I think that God doesn't exist. That's where my attitude stopped. The idea that there's a hatred there seems to me to be just absurd. Um, what must happen on the other side is that they're imputing to you some level of belief in God. At some level, you know God exists. Now we can make sense of the idea that you hate God, yeah. right? Um, and there's a kind of corresponding move on the other side. So, George Ray... Um, insists that really deep down everyone knows that there's no God, right? There are people who believe in God are just self-deceived. At some level, they know it isn't so, right? Now, that that kind of dispute is, I think, is not very edifying on either side, right? It was a trope for hundreds of years that there couldn't be intellectual atheists, right? Everyone knew deep down that God exists. Atheists, if there were such people, were just saying things for show, you know, or, or you know, out of vanity or something like that, right? I don't, I don't, I, I just think that those kinds of accusations on either side are just baseless and not, and unedifying and not getting us anywhere and we should stop doing it. Wow. This was amazing. Honestly, I seriously love every minute of this. I really appreciate you coming on. I hope everybody goes and checks out the books. Seriously, this one right here is a must get. It's it's for most people, such as myself, you know, to get a better grasp on the basics. And that's what I need to do, in fact. And I, I plan to have you back, if that's okay, in the future, to specifically talk about this book. I can promise you I won't do you dirty like I did this episode. <laughs> and we went all over the place. So please forgive me on that. And also, oh, it's no problem. Of course, I'm happy to come back. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry we jumped around. It, I, ha I thought to myself, all these episodes that I've interviewed other scholars, I wanted to somehow bring it and make it something you could address. But in the upcoming episode, let's cover the details in your book um, and educate people. I love to educate the general public. Get this uh, information out there so everybody can read Dr. Oppie's work. 
brilliant mind, honestly, a wonderful, brilliant mind. And you carry yourself in a way, Dr. Oppie, that anyone, you're approachable. You're not, you have, you, there's no ill intent. The, there's no chip on your shoulder. And that's one of the things I commend you most for, especially in such a controversial topic, such as atheism in America, America, you know, there's some serious fundamentalists over here. And I use the term as in what I was, uh, we, we definitely thought you guys hated God and, uh, you know, we didn't really like atheists and now here I am one. So thank you. Cheers. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, we are myth vision. <laughs>